Well, like she said, I'm Jared. Uh, graduated in May, BFA acting. Yeah, and what are you doing now? Oh, yeah, that's good. <laughs> We're on a roll. We're on a roll. Um, right now, I'm currently uh, producing an original one-man show that I wrote here as my thesis. Um, and I'm producing that in upstate New York. And then I'm moving to uh, New York City in just a few short weeks. Yeah, uh, and I'm Greg. I graduated with Jared 2014 from Elon. I was a political science major, and I currently work at the Institute of Politics at the Harvard Kennedy School. Today we want to talk to you about an experience that we had uh, in our last semester here at Elon that we think was really valuable and can be valuable for other students. So um, a group, small group of students last semester, we got together and um, we talked about this idea that you may have heard uh, called threshold concepts. Um, we also learned through our discussions that pizza and beer makes a great sustenance for uh, all these intellectual ideas. Really works yeah. well. Yeah, so as Jared said, we, uh, this seminar met in a, in a pizza shop, actually. It was organized by two Elon faculty members, uh, and seven students were asked to participate. Uh, it was entirely optional. Uh, we weren't given class credit. There was reading involved, and you weren't required to write, but we kind of ended up writing stuff anyway. Mm -hmm. And um, the, the students were from all disciplines. I mean, you know, theater, political science, uh, psychology, math, uh, a lot of different majors. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, I want to talk a little bit more about threshold concepts. I'd imagine some of you have heard about it. I know this conference actually a couple of years ago was about threshold concepts. I was oh. probably like a freshman, so I didn't know that this existed then. But um, so threshold concepts is a framework for understanding student learning in higher education disciplines. So uh, Meyer and Land, who are two of the key scholars that talk about it, um, they describe threshold concepts like this. They say, a threshold concept can be considered akin to a portal opening up a new and previously inaccessible way of thinking about something. It represents a transformed way of understanding or interpreting or viewing something without which the learner cannot progress. So words you often hear associated with threshold concepts would be troublesome, transformative, um, bounded. Uh, the list kind of goes on, and we sort of developed some of our own as well. <laughs> right. So Meyer and Land uh, gave us this idea of a sort of a portal or a doorway through which we go. And this is our visualization of that process. Um, and here's our portal. And once crossed <laughs> the portal, once you cross through the portal, right, um, the knowledge cannot be unlearned according to this theory, right? This is like uh, uh, a movie ticket or a crappy wedding gift. It's non-refundable, right? <laughs> Can't be unlearned. It becomes. Uh, integrated, not only ingrained in the student's memory, but integrated into the student's worldview. Um, so this is uh, the, the process that we discussed throughout the semester. Uh, it's more discrete attributes and uh, its potential to empower student learning. So what's an example? Well, thanks for asking. <laughs> The first example that Meyer and Land gave in the first readings that we had, even you know, before we met, um, was opportunity cost, right? Economics, the idea of um, cost-benefit analysis, weighing options, choosing or maybe not choosing, and what that means. So the student who understands opportunity cost really well might be able to do well on the test, right? That makes sense. But the student who has crossed the opportunity cost threshold maybe can better understand how we allocate scarce resources in everyday life. Um, they will be able to have a better understanding of this concept and how it applies to their views outside of the um, discipline. Yeah, and then another example that we, we talked about uh, in our seminar we actually came to sort of halfway through uh, was in jazz. Uh, and this is something that uh, Wynton Marsalis, a trumpet player and, and jazz educator, talks about. Um, is that you can't really play jazz without understanding love and without un like playing with love. Um, so another way to sort of flip that and think about that, if you've passed through that threshold uh, and you hear a jazz musician who understands love and plays with love, uh, and then you hear another musician who does not do that, they will sound different. And you can tell the difference. So by the end of our, our seminar, we kind of had three main observations. Um, and the first of which was that there was really a lot of ambiguity in the language that we used to describe threshold concepts, right? What might be troublesome for one student isn't necessarily going to be troublesome for another student. And uh, what might be transformative in one discipline 
uh, that kind of threshold might not be transformative in another one. We really struggled to find common ground in um, defining what a threshold concept really is. Yeah. Uh, and then uh, something else we sort of ran into is that we think that the liberal arts complicates threshold concepts. Um, you know, as I said, the theory um, it originated in the UK. Um, and so as we started thinking about it as liberal arts majors, we started asking questions, well, are there liberal arts thresholds? Are, you know, are there like meta thresholds that we're supposed to pass through if, if you study you know, at a liberal arts institution? Um, and eventually we sort of came, well, maybe like all disciplines have thresholds, but liberal arts majors pass through thresholds in other disciplines. That's just part of being a liberal arts major. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And going off of that, um, our third finding was uh, stemmed from the fact that our, our seminar was interdisciplinary, right? And that different thresholds in different disciplines are going to have different characteristics. So if you think about a threshold that you have to cross in order to understand something in discrete mathematics, that might not necessarily impact the way that you view the global culture, right? Or your, your, your complete worldview. But maybe something like in the arts will. Um, maybe something in ballet you learn, and it's like, oh, this does impact my worldview, or vice versa. Again, we come back to this idea of ambiguity, and, and we're not really sure how to define um, basically these, g these general characteristics of a threshold concept. Um, and we would love to keep talking about threshold concepts and talk to anyone about threshold concepts later, but um, the reason that Jared and I really wanted to give this presentation and what we thought was really uh, sort of notable and, and I think exceptional about the seminar was the process that we took to get to these findings. Um, and I'll, I'll share two, two uh, quotations from students when they were asked to reflect on it. Uh, and then we'll talk a little bit of, you know, more about what we uh, experienced. But so one student who is a, a senior uh, psychology major said, I would say this is one of the most high impact and deeply engaging things I got to do while I was at Elon. The whole group looked forward to the meetings and was comfortable challenging one another. We all talked about threshold concepts outside of the meetings and shared them with people who weren't part of the group. The way the faculty set it up was very unlike a traditional class because we were co-investigators of an interesting question with no clear, correct answer. We were journeying together. And then another student who was a junior political science major, uh, when, when we asked this student to reflect, the first thing this student jumped to was uh, a meeting that we had set up. It was probably halfway through the, the, halfway the, the seminar. Yeah. So, uh, and we told the faculty leaders that uh, we wanted to meet by ourselves uh, one night. And we were going we were gonna to talk about some stuff and get back to them. You know, we wanted to do this. <laughs> we'll let you know what we find. Yeah, <laughs> we'll let you know what we think. Um, so this student said, uh, working through the hows, whats, and whys of threshold concepts was an incredibly challenging but rewarding intellectual experience. The guiding questions from the faculty pushed our thinking and forced us to justify our reasoning. But the night we met without professors was just as beneficial, allowing us to really outline the basic ideas of threshold concepts we agreed and disagreed with, while determining which aspects were still unclear. The informal student-only meeting served as a sort of clarifying midpoint that guided the remainder of our meetings by focusing the discussion on areas we still needed to explore more deeply. So something we noticed to not, you know, interestingly sort of funny was that a lot of the language we were using to describe threshold concepts was very, very similar, uh, or it was similar to the language that Meyer and Land were talking about with threshold mm -hmm. concepts. So we talked about this seminar, you know, things like uh, transformative, troublesome, that's what we were saying the seminar was. Uh, so for those who have seen the movie Inception, this would be thresholdception. <laughs> Um, a threshold within a threshold. But in, in all seriousness, what, what we noticed happened in this seminar was that a faculty member came to us and asked us to, what we thought about their research, really. And we all kind of you know, said, well, cool. Like, <laughs> that, sounds, that sounds really interesting. We all kind of had, we talked about it like, almost like a bug. We, like, caught the, you know, we would talk about it. We would think about it just when we were walking down to class or mm -hmm. you know, would see each other in the hallways. And that was very different than uh, you know, some classes that we've taken, sure, but you know, that was a very different experience than maybe a traditional class. Mm -hmm. And we're not saying that we need to scrap traditional classrooms and all go out for pizza and beer for the rest of our <laughs> learning. It might be more fun, but probably not as useful. We are saying that this was a really exciting supplement to classroom learning, right? It was something that was engaging, interesting, and really did impact our intellectual journey 
Um, and, and it was new and exciting for the students. Um, so what? what? Why are we here, right? Why, what is it that we're trying to get uh, uh, across to you guys? Um, not that I look like Harrison Ford, kind of, maybe, a little bit. Um, but that the student perspective, we think, is critical in developing methods in teaching and learning. We think students should be involved in teaching and learning policies, um, or making te teaching and learning methods, uh, because we think students can have great ideas. And uh, what we experienced was this sort of ripple effect of um, engaged activity and curiosity uh, from students, uh, from, I don't know, meeting at, until 1 a.m., 2 a.m. in someone's apartment and talking about these ideas, to having students outside of our seminar asking questions, wondering what it is that we're doing, what it is that where our thoughts are going, and um, how the seminar is going. Um, and that is really important because this is a process that ultimately directly affects our educational experience, right? So it seems only natural that the student perspective should be included. So what, I guess what are we actually saying? We, what, what are the outcomes we're expecting here? Um, you know, we would imagine that everyone here is interested in teaching and learning and, and you know, maybe does research on teaching and learning. Um, you know, and we're saying that ask your students to do a seminar like this. I, I mean, I can guarantee that students will say yes. They're, they're going to be interested. Um, and we think there are other ways you could, you could like, model this sort of experience. You know, if you're a faculty member teaching a couple of classes, you know, have a seminar, an, an informal seminar for students to talk about teaching and learning in your discipline, and they can, they can opt into that seminar. Um, and we also want to hear you know, in the question and answer session later about things I would imagine people are doing things like this, and we'd love to hear about it and hear about, uh, you know, other ways to do it. Um, the, the last thing we'll, we'll say, uh, I, political nerds will know this story, I, and it's a, I think it's a good story for this, but um, Tip O'Neill was the Speaker of the House uh, during the Reagan administration, and he was uh, elected in a district pretty close to where I'm from. And he, uh, it was a pretty, he, he, he lost his first race in that district, and he went back home and asked people, well, why, like, why didn't you vote for me? And his neighbor, uh, who he'd known for years, she was like, well, I, you know, I, I didn't vote for you. And uh, he's like, well, I mowed your lawn. I, you know, I've known you forever. I, I would shovel your driveway for you. Like, why, why would you not vote for me? And she said that you never asked. And we, you know, we really think that students, they want to be asked about this. They want to be asked about teaching sure. and learning. And I think if, if faculty do ask them, faculty and staff do ask them, they'll really be interested. So, Thank you. Thanks.